introduce myself and then uh, tell you guys what we're here for. My name is Reggie Jackson and I am the uh, head griot for America's Black Holocaust Museum. For those of you unfamiliar with the term griot, it's a term used in West Africa uh, to describe the oral historians, the keepers of the history of those particular communities. They play a very, very important role uh, in the history of West African people. They have to learn the history of the entire community. Uh, they have to learn about your great, 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 great grandfather. So if you ask a question about him, they should be able to tell you something about him. They are advisors to the leaders of different communities. They have to know before anybody else in the community knows that such and such and so and so and his wife are about to have a baby. They have to make that announcement. They can't let somebody else do it, otherwise they're not on their job. And it's kind of passed down from generation to generation. So if your father was a griot, then you're gonna be trained as a griot as well. So it's, it's something that's always been a very important part of uh, West African people's traditions in particular, uh, being griots. And so I'm not the only griot that's in the room tonight though. Uh, one of our other griots from America's Black Holocaust Museum is here with us, Mr. Hibby Hazlett. And uh, he was there at the museum uh, for a number of years, giving tours uh, and interacting with our customers. And I'm sure that, that he would tell you guys it was a, a great experience for him. Well, I had great teachers. It was, it was a, 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 a real experience. It was uh, uh, one that I got more than I gave. Well, great, great. And so uh, I'm here to talk to you guys about uh, what I call Do Black Lives Matter? And this particular session is talking about legal and extra legal violence uh, against blacks in American history. And so I've done three other sessions leading up to this one. And I have to, I have to be honest with you, this session, uh, for me, uh, putting together this, this session, uh, doing the research, uh, gathering the information for it, man, it was hard. And it wasn't hard in terms of hard to find the stuff. It was hard in terms of, man, this stuff is it's, it's tough. It's very emotional uh, to look at, at, at these particular issues. It's been difficult looking at some of the other ones, looking at the history of blacks being used as guinea pigs by the medical establishment, uh, looking at some of the laws that, that devalue black lives. Those things were difficult as well, but nothing uh, was as difficult as looking at uh, this brutal, brutal treatment over a long, long period of time that blacks have endured. And uh, so we're going to be talking about some very ugly things tonight. Uh, and it may become very emotional for you guys. Um, so our focus is looking at legally justified violence, uh, examining the role of laws that allow beatings and killings and rapes of enslaved blacks to take place, uh, the history of lynching, we're going to talk about uh, race riots uh, and pogroms against black communities. Uh, we're not going to talk about Rosewood, but we are going to talk about Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, the history of police forces and their complicity in violence uh, perpetrated by citizens and terror groups such as the Ku Klux Klan, America's first organized terrorist group. And we'll look at the tradition of blacks being killed by law enforcement up to and including present day events and look at the disparities in the use of death penalty uh, at the end of this session. Uh, and I was having a conversation with my wife uh, about a week ago about uh, this and you know I was telling her some of the stories I was going to share in terms of some of the police shootings and things and, and she says she says it's gotten to the point where it happens so much I can't even keep track of them. She says, you know, I remember this one, I remember that one, but it's so many of them I can't keep track anymore. And I thought that that was a, a real testament to how prevalent these things are. So uh, as, as I like to do, we have a, a specific Q&A procedure. I have index cards, and I don't know if any of them are left. If not, I have some in my bag. Uh, that if you have questions during the course of the presentation, just write the question on the index card, and I'll do my best to answer it. And I know you guys are leaving early, you said. But if you do have questions and you want to ask before you leave, please feel free to interrupt me and do so. So I don't want you guys to leave with questions unanswered, uh, if I can help it, OK? so. Um, we're gonna go ahead and this is kind of my motivation for this, the, the whole Black Lives Matter movement, the statement that Black Lives Matter, which I say is a no-brainer, obviously Black Lives Matter, but then I say, well, let's take a look back in American history and ask ourselves, can we find evidence that Black Lives have mattered in American history? And so I'm trying to bring those stories to you 
uh, to show you that there has been a tremendous amount of devaluation of black lives for a long extended period in American history. Now, I have to warn you with this one, uh, more so than with any of the others I've done, there are some very, very graphic photographs uh, and videos that I'll show you which dict you know, it, 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 it's difficult to talk about this without doing it by showing you sometimes. Sometimes you can talk about something, but to actually see it is something that has a completely different impact on, on how you look at it. So I'm going to show you guys some very ugly uh, pictures and videos tonight. So just be warned of that. Now, how many of you guys have ever heard of the Willie Lynch theory before? It's something that I guarantee you that 90% of black people have heard this. And it was supposedly this book written uh, back in the 1700s by this, this wealthy planner from, from Barbados who came to the Carolinas to teach these white plantation owners how to control black people. And it went on to talk about all these different methods he used. If you ever hear anybody talking about it, stop them in their tracks and say, that is baloney, it's garbage, it's not true. It's made up, it's fictional. But there was a book, and I believe the person that wrote that so-called Willie Lynch letter actually copied this book. And this book is titled, The Practical Rules for the Management of Negro Slaves in the Sugar Colonies by a professional planner, Dr. Collins, first published in 1811. And he, he dictates uh, how to become a professional slave owner the things that you need to do uh, in terms of learning how to train them to do the work that they need to do, uh, working on how to maintain discipline among the slaves that you own, all of those different things are dictated uh, in, that, in that book. And I was very fortunate to come across that, reading about it, and it took me about maybe six months to find some place where I could actually buy the book. It was out of print, and it was very difficult to find, but I was fortunate enough that I was able to find it and it's, it's absolutely fascinating. So the reason that I brought that book up is because I want you guys to read this passage from the book. And this was in chapter 7 where he's talking about discipline. I'll give you guys a few moments to uh, read through that and then we'll talk about it. So here you have a man who called himself a professional planter who wrote a book that he wanted other slave owners to read to learn how to be effective slave owners. And he talked about why violence was such a crucial part of being a slave owner. It was impossible to be an effective slave owner, in his opinion, without using terror and fear and corrective discipline. And so this is early on in American history. This is kind of the mindset that people who own the African men, women, and children, they had to coerce them to work for free by using violence. And so this violence has been a part of the experience of black people uh, since they first arrived in the country. Uh, these are a few laws. I talked about these two laws at one of the other sessions, but just want to just mention these two in, in, in particular because I think they are instructive in terms of looking at how America saw blacks at this particular time. So there was an act in Virginia in 1669 that talked about the casual killing of slaves, and, and it says that if an enslaved African dies while resisting his master, it's basically okay if he's killed. So you're basically giving the slave owners permission to kill an African man, woman, or child if they are resisting you, okay? So you basically have a law that says you have permission to kill them and nothing will happen to you. You won't violate any laws. You won't have to worry about being uh, accosted by the authorities. You just move on as if nothing happened. In addition to that, three years later, they wrote another law which talked about uh, wounding or killing an enslaved African who resist arrest. So if the authorities were costing this person and they resisted, then they also had permission to kill them. However, they would have to pay compensation to the owner for his loss of property. So you're giving 
everyday average citizens permission to kill black people legally. And then three years later, you're giving the authorities, the police force, permission to kill black people without worrying about any consequences. And so this is early on in American history, before we even become a nation. We're still just in colonies. And so you already have in place a system that allows you to kill black people. So that, to me, is the ultimate in devaluation of black lives. You're giving somebody permission to just take their life and not have to worry about being punished, with the exception of maybe having to pay somebody the value of that person that they, whose life they took. So this devaluation of black lives was cemented into law early on. Uh, a couple slave codes that we talked about. Uh, an enslaved African who was found guilty of arson or rape of a white woman or conspiracy to rebel was put to death almost immediately. Uh, since the enslaved African woman was considered chattel, any white man who raped her was guilty only of a trespass on the master's property. And rape was extremely common on the plantations. In fact, uh, many historians have written about how for a majority of white males, especially young white males, their first sexual encounter would have been with an African woman or child. They tested their abilities on these African women before they ever had uh, relationships with a white woman. So this was kind of like a coming out ceremony for these young white men in particular. <laughs> so our police departments actually began many, many years ago as slave patrols throughout the colonies. Uh, so in 1671, Charleston, South Carolina deployed what they called the night watch using constables and rotation of different citizens to patrol and make sure that the enslaved Africans were doing what they were supposed to do. So they kept a very close eye on them. Uh, in 1696, they wrote a law that required all able-bodied white men to serve in the slave patrols. Before that, it was just kind of, you know, we'll pick and choose whoever we want. But then it became mandatory. And a lot of these men didn't want to do it, but they were forced to by law, whether they wanted to or not. By 1734, the slave patrollers were actually getting paid for the first time. Uh, and so in 1739, there was this huge uh, rebellion called the Stono Rebellion. Uh, and it led to even stricter slave codes that really put very tight parameters on what blacks would be able to do. Uh, and it uh, also converted uh, these night watches into the first effective police forces in the nation. So our police departments actually developed as a result of slave patrols growing uh, in stature and eventually becoming something that would be a paid position to keep an eye on the enslaved African men, women, and children. Anyone have any questions about this before we move forward? Uh, Stono Rebellion, 1739. I never heard of that one. Look it up. I'm going to. Song? Yes. I said, just a, a, a technical thing, I guess. 17, excuse me, 16, um, 69 and 74, uh, the colonies were under the jurisdiction of Great Britain. Yes. Uh, I would assume under British law. Under what authority were laws being made in the colonies that... They basically followed follow the British law. In addition, a lot... South Carolina has a very interesting history. South Carolina, the first whites who actually went to, to South Carolina and formed, formed you know, this colony, actually came from Barbados. They were planters who lived in Barbados, and, and they were very good at growing cotton. And so what happened, the British government offered them the opportunity to move to the mainland to start a new colony. And they actually said, we will give you free land, and we will pay you a certain dollar amount for every slave that you bring with you. So there was this huge inducement for them to bring these, these Africans with them. And so the laws that they put in place followed the laws that they had put in place for many, many years on the island of Barbados, which was, was, was you know, was a British colonial position as well. And so it, it really followed British law to the most part. So, so Great Britain then had, was in a position of having to uh, uh, condone or approve or ratify or whatever laws that were um, Absolutely. signed off on by the governors yeah. of the they, they actually had colonial governors that were put in place right. by the British government, and they had to answer to the British government. So. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. At about the same time, 1696-1671, the British were shipping uh, unruly Irish 
to the United States and selling a 99-year, um, they didn't call it slavery, they called it uh, indenture. Indenture. Yes, a 99-year indenture on these people whom they didn't really want back in Ireland and England. So it's, it's not a lot different. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, you, you develop these methods of controlling people, regardless of who the people are. If you decide to go for one group of people to control another group of people, you use the same mechanisms, same tactics. So it, it made perfect sense. Yes, sir? I'm just curious. Uh, there were no police forces like in the city of New York back in the 1700s? No. They, they had no no organized police forces at all. It was, it was kind of people kind of policed themselves. They did have constables who kind of regulated the behavior of people, but there were no organized forces uh, at all in place. All right, so let's move on. Uh, they built jails to support the new police forces. Many communities began to build jails to house uh, slaves that they captured. They were designed to house people, enslaved Africans who were wandering or had run away. And in larger communities, they built really, really extremely large jails to house you know, hundreds and, and, and perhaps even thousands of people uh, over the course of time. Uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna skip from that to uh, the period after the Civil War is known as Reconstruction. So you had what we call the Reconstruction Amendments that we talked about, the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery, the 14th Amendment, which gave black citizenship rights, the 15th Amendment, which gave blacks the right to vote. And so they had all of these, these, these you know, rights that were given to them, but they didn't last very long because uh, by the late 1870s, uh, the last of the Union troops were taken out of the South who were there to protect the blacks, which I talked about in one of the earlier sessions. And so groups like the Ku Klux Klan began to terrorize blacks immensely. And they were so horrendous in terms of the violence that they perpetrated that the federal government actually outlawed the Klan. They passed the Anti-Klan Act in 1871. And so that kind of, uh, it ended some of the violence by the Klan, but it didn't end all of it. But within, within a short period of time, though, the Klan was kind of non-existent. It was started by some former Confederate soldiers. It did what it did, terrorizing blacks, preventing them from utilizing these rights they had. But after a certain period of time, they didn't really need uh, those vigilante groups uh, to do what they were doing because now they put laws in place that did the same thing in terms of setting in new types of controls over the lives of black people. And so, in the 1880s, you began to see lynchings take place across the country in very, very large numbers. Uh, and that continued uh, pretty much unabated into the 1930s. So let's look at some of that. Um, lynching was used as a tool to devalue the lives of blacks. This particular image that you're seeing here is in Duluth, Minnesota. These three young black men who were killed were circus workers. They worked at a circus there. And a young white couple came to the circus and they decided to play a practical joke and pretend that the white girl had been raped. So they told the authorities, these black guys raped me, and so they went looking for some black people, uh, and they accosted these three individuals in particular. They were pointed out as the ones who did it. A mob gathered, they ended up murdering these three young men. They posed for the picture, and later the girl admitted it was just a joke. She had never even seen these guys before, and she was sorry. And then the photograph uh, was colorized? Like that? I actually colorized the photograph. Oh. <laughs> I did that. Uh, you know, I, I used to look at this picture all the time. And, and one of the things I noticed, we had this picture in the museum. Uh, people would always miss the guy on the ground. Ah. They would never see him. And I said, well, I'm going to make him stand out. So I used a program on my computer to colorize him. And I said, well, let me colorize all three of them. And it kind of makes them stand out. Uh, a little bit. And so anyway, uh, the, the evaluation of black lives by lynch moms was a message sent by white society that regardless of what you may feel as a black person, we determine what value your life has because we can take your life any time that we choose. So in many cases, uh, part of the ritual of these mass lynchings was to dismember the bodies of these individuals. So they would cut off body parts, the ears, fingers, toes, genitalia. Uh, they would cut up the clothing, they would cut up the lynching ropes, they took a variety of different things, the teeth out of the mouth. There was a guy who was lynched in Atlanta, Georgia, and they actually cut his hand off, and they put his hand in a jar. 
uh, in, in, in a jar in, in one of the department stores on the main street in Atlanta. So when people walk past the store, they would see his hand uh, in that jar uh, as, as amusement. Uh, and so it was done for amusement, and it was also done to terrorize blacks as well. So let's continue, and, and we'll talk a little bit about the mindset that went into these, these ritual lynchings. So lynching is generally defined as murder at the hands of non-law enforcement personnel. The victims are often taken out of the custody of a local jail and murdered for a perceived act they have been accused of. In many cases, uh, they have not even been arrested or formally charged with any crime. They're not afforded the due process process of law, even though it was mandated. In some cases, an act in violation of societal norms is all that's required to be lynched for black victims. I'll give you some examples. Uh, you would take your life into your own hands as a black person if you were having a conversation with a white person and you looked them in the eye. That was a violation of societal norms. If you forgot to say yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes sir, no sir, if you were an 85-year-old black man and a 14-year-old white kid was talking to you, you had to say yes sir, no sir to him. Uh, if you were a black man or woman, an adult, you would never refer to by uh, Mr. or Miss. You would never call by your last name. They would always call you Tommy or Jimmy. So that was a way of letting you know that you didn't have enough value. And so this mindset was very prevalent. And in, in nearly all recorded lynchings, an investigation afterwards finds that the victim was killed by parties unknown. Even though, in many of those cases, people posed in the picture. And it wasn't just some random person that came by and took the picture. These were professional photographers, in most cases, that actually set the scene. They got people in the right position. They got the lighting set up just right. And then they snapped the picture. And they sold those pictures for a profit. Those pictures were often placed on postcards. And you could go to the local, you know, five and dime store and buy a postcard uh, with a lynching photograph on the front of it, write your little message on the back, stick a stamp on it, stick it in the mail, just like you would if you went to New York, you got a postcard of the Statue of Liberty. Same process. And people had no problem doing this. So oftentimes the victims were mutilated in cases to provide souvenirs such as body parts, clothing, lynching ropes, etc., which I mentioned earlier. And we have records of just under 4,000 documented lynchings that were recorded from 1882 to 1930. Obviously, those are just the ones that we know about. Those are the ones that somebody found in a newspaper. It may have been a short little article in some little mom and pop little newspaper in some little hick town in southern Georgia or northern Mississippi or whatever. But many of these lynchings went unaccounted for. People just simply disappeared and they were never heard from again. No one knows what happened to them uh, and they weren't documented. So, uh, you know, historians have, have, have you know, talked about the real number of lynchings, but nobody, nobody can tell. It's absolutely impossible. But there is a group that did some study. Um, just their report came out just, I believe, in March or April. Um, and what they did is they looked into it. They investigated lynchings in southern states, and they were able to document an additional 700 that had never been documented before. So that number is now closer to 5,000 with those additional uh, data that they provided uh, very recently. So this was a man by the name of William Brown who was lynched in Omaha, Nebraska in 1919. And so that's a picture of Mr. Brown here. Uh, that's his gravestone. Uh, he was 40 years of age when he was killed. And once again, you see a picture of the individuals posing in front of his remains. He was actually taken out of the jail by a mob of whites who had gathered to lynch him. A group of blacks came to town to prevent the lynching. The authorities kind of dispersed the two crowds. They went their own separate ways. The whites came back later, took him out of the jail. He was accused of accosting a white woman. And so they took him out of the jail. They hung him up on a trolley pole. They had a trolley system in Omaha. They tied him on a trolley pole, and the crowd of whites emptied their guns into his body. The mayor tried to intervene on his behalf, and they grabbed the mayor and tried to string him up on the same trolley pole. Fortunately for the mayor, the police intervened on his behalf and saved his life. But after they emptied their bullets into Mr. Brown's uh, body, they tied him to the back of a vehicle and they drove him around town for a little while, you know, hoopering and hollering and things of that nature. And then they brought him to this area and they, they put wood and, and, and other flammable materials under his body and they, they poured kerosene on his body and set his remains 
on fire and they actually fought over the remains after his body cooled off as well. And that actually led to a huge race riot uh, that they had to bring the National Guard in to quell the disturbance in Omaha. That was in 1919. We'll talk about 1919 a little bit later. It's a very important year uh, in, in American history, which most of us are completely unaware of some of the things that happened that year that really had a huge impact on race relations. All right, so that's William Brown. Uh, this man by the name of Jesse Washington, he was burned alive uh, in Waco, Texas. A uh, crowd that they estimated about five to 10,000 people were there to witness him screaming in horror as he was set on fire. Uh, this lynching took place in Kentucky, I believe. And if you notice, there's a sign here and it says, please do not wake this black man that they killed. Um, and now you know what? This is actually Mr. Hartfield, now that I think about it. This is John Hartfield. And there was a, a story in the newspaper that announcing that they were gonna lynch him in Ellisville, Mississippi at five o'clock this afternoon. So if you didn't know about it, there was a notice put in the paper letting you know, okay, you can come out and witness it. And there's a series of photographs of this particular lynching. There's a photograph where he was captured by the authorities. Uh, this particular photograph where he was actually hung up on the tree uh, in the downtown area. They took him down off of this and they took him out to a, a, an area, a wooded area, a big wide open wooded area. You can see the thousands of people that are there to witness it. And they put him and they hang him, his body from this tree there and then they cut his body down and they set his body on fire with all of these people just, you know, and just exhilarated by the experience. And so oftentimes the word spread ahead of time and people were able to come in from neighboring communities to witness. Oftentimes they would rent out trains specifically to bring people to those communities to witness those lynchings as well. The black women were lynched as well. Uh, we don't have a real uh, good understanding of the exact number of black women that were lynched, but there are uh, documented cases of dozens of them. This is the only photograph I've ever seen of a black woman who was a lynch victim. Her name was Laura Nelson. She was lynched in Oklahoma in 1911, but she wasn't lynched by herself. She was actually lynched right along with her son. This is her Lord Nelson, and this is her son, L.D. Nelson. They were lynched May 25th, 1911, in a little town called Okima, Oklahoma. So what precipitated this lynching? Me, yes. Can you go back one picture? Yes. On the bottom of the picture, it says copyright something or other. 1911. 1911. And it has the, uh, the name photographer's name. Okay, copyright. Yep, it has they the They were selling name. those pictures. Yes, absolutely. So that's the photographer's name. Uh, and so here you see the same name here, and yeah. he tells you where it took place. So what happened was, uh, Lori Nelson was accused of stealing from a grocery store in town. She adamantly denied that she had stolen anything. The authorities came and accosted her about it. They got too rough with her. Her son tried to help her out by jumping in and saying, leave my mother alone. And they ended up lynching both of them. Uh, and someone actually took the time to count how many people were on this bridge and it was something like 78 people on the bridge. And they actually broke it down by men, women, and children. I can't remember the exact numbers. But you can see once again that they are posing for a professional photographer to take a photograph of who is Lori Nelson selling and her the son. pictures. Who's selling the picture? The photographer. The photographer. The pictures. Yes, absolutely. And you 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 were able to make a a, a very uh, nice amount of money by selling these, these pictures because people wanted souvenirs. If they couldn't get souvenirs in terms of body parts, this was the next best thing. All right, so let's move on. Uh, many of you have heard the story of Emmett Till, 14-year-old boy who was killed in Money, Mississippi uh, because he flirted with a white woman uh, at her husband's store. Now this story is very close to me because uh, Money, Mississippi is only about 15 to 20 miles away from the town that I was born and raised in in Mississippi. And so I was telling someone recently that back in maybe 2007, I believe it was, I can't remember, I think it was 2007, I had actually planned on making a trip down to Mississippi to visit my relatives and then I was going to go and spend some time over in Money, Mississippi to kind of investigate, you know, what happened with the murder of Emmett Till. And my family in Mississippi gave me a very stern lecture and said, you can come and visit us, 
but do not go anywhere near that town. They will not talk to you about this story. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want anybody talking about it. You may end up missing if you go over there trying to talk to somebody about it. So, of course, I listened to them because they lived there, and I didn't make that trip. Yes, sir. Uh, I, was, I was down there about a week ago. I was doing, you know, they got a museum. Mm -hmm. They got a museum, and uh, they got the place where actually where they took the weapons out of this bar when they to the museum where they killed it with. Mm -hmm. And the river was over, you know, in the back. Yeah, Tallahatchie River. came from down there a week ago. Okay. They named the highway after. Yeah, yeah, and so, you know, what ends up happening in the cases of some of these events is that people are very reluctant to talk about it, but what they did, uh, people kept the investigation going uh, because the people that actually killed Emmett Till, uh, two of them went on trial and they were found, of course, not guilty by an all-white jury. After they did that, they actually gave an interview to, I believe it was Life Magazine, where they basically told exactly what they did. They pretty much admitted it because they knew double jeopardy, they couldn't be held responsible. And they received, I believe, like $3,000 each for giving that interview to Life Magazine. And so uh, some people uh, from, from Till's family in Chicago have kept up this, this, this kind of pressure on people to not bury this story in money, Mississippi, to have people talk about it. And so I'm sure that the effort of building a museum came directly out of that. Yes, sir. Uh, in 2008, I was down there at the site. And at that time, the store at which he had walked in and spoken, supposedly spoken to the woman, mm -hmm. uh, was a complete wreck. It had been abandoned. Mm -hmm. okay. And no, nobody in town was anywhere near. We had a tour bus. And so we were pulling up and walking up and down, taking pictures and so forth. And okay. it's a Mississippi, very small town with a, a little bit of agricultural work. And that's about it. That's, that's the whole state of Mississippi. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan uh, was involved in, in this murder. I don't know if you guys recognize this picture. Anybody recognize this picture? Yeah. It looks like the uh, Board of Registration workers that were down there in Mississippi. Yes. Yeah. Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney. This was their vehicle that they were pulled over in by the police, uh, eventually released by the police, but released into oh, okay. the hands of the Klan with the police there assisting them. And obviously, you guys have seen probably this missing poster, yeah. but you've probably not seen the picture of them when they found their bodies. Now, have you seen the movie Mississippi Burning, anybody? Yeah. One of the lionest movies that's ever been made in the history of American cinema. They make the FBI as the hero of the movie like they did this wonderful investigation, and they found the bodies because of the investigation. That's utter nonsense. They actually went throughout the state of Mississippi looking for these young men's bodies. And, and I've heard the story that they found seven or eight different black men's bodies floating in rivers throughout the state. They had the Navy down there searching. They were searching all over the place. They would have never, ever found the bodies. They had actually been buried under a, a dam in, in, in uh, Philadelphia, Mississippi. So what happened was a member of the Ku Klux Klan was an informant for the FBI because the FBI had infiltrated the Klan in an attempt to destroy the Klan. And he knew exactly where the bodies were. And he told them that, I'll tell you where they are, but you have to pay me. And they eventually decided to give that man $30,000. And he told them where the bodies were. That's how they found the bodies. Not because of this wonderful investigative techniques they use. Nobody in Mississippi would talk to them. It was a code of silence. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's, that's, that's the three young men that they killed. And, and, and if you read anything about the story in particular, they took out the, the worst of their violence against uh, Mr. Cheney. They actually beat and tortured him before they murdered him. Uh, these were the men who were implicated in the murder of these three civil rights workers. And of course, being Mississippi, it was very difficult to find a jury that was going to find them guilty. And so they were implicated in it. And this was very common for the Klan and the police to be bosom buddies. In many cases, the police officers were Klan members as well, which, which brings me to something that I read. Uh, about a month and a half ago that 
back in the maybe 2005 or 2006 time frame that the FBI had gotten word from informants that they had in different uh, neo-Nazi and, and Klan groups around the country. They had gotten notification that these groups were planning to do something they had never done before. They were going to begin to recruit people to infiltrate police departments around the country. And so the FBI sent out a notice to every police department in the United States of America warning them that the Klan and these neo-Nazi groups will be planning to send people to infiltrate your organizations on purpose. Keep an eye out for these people. Everybody ignored it. Everybody ignored it. You have to be looking in the mirror. <laughs> and so I can guarantee you that those efforts uh, bore fruit for those groups. And there are many people who are probably Klan members or Klan supporters who are police officers. This is a young man by the name of Michael Donald. He was 19. He was killed in Mobile, Alabama. And I, I've told this story before. He was walking on his way to buy a pair of cigarettes, uh, to buy a pack of cigarettes, rather. And uh, some men pulled up in a car next to him, and they forced him into the car at gunpoint. They took him out to a rural area, and they beat him. He fought back best he could. They hit him over the head with a big branch from a tree, knocked him out. They cut his neck one way, two ways, three ways to make sure he was dead. They tied this rope around his neck and brought him back and tied him just a couple blocks away from where they lived. Uh, and so they were eventually caught. And the reason that they killed Michael Donald, he was just a random black person walking down the street. Uh, uh, the year before this happened, there was a white police officer in Mobile who had been killed by a black man. Now, they arrested the black man for it, but they didn't really have very good evidence. He went on trial uh, two different times, I believe. There was a hung jury both times, so they, they basically said, we're going to leave this man alone. We can't prove that he did it. It may be somebody else. And so the, the leader of the biggest Klan group in the country at that time was the United Klans of America. They were the ones that were responsible for most of the Klan violence in the 1950s and 60s. This is the biggest and baddest Klan group that was around. And so their leader got on the podium and said these famous words. He said, if a black man can get away with killing a white man, then a white man should be able to get away with killing a black man. The following day, his son and another member of the United Clans of America went out looking for a black man to kill. Michael Donald happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, after they murdered him and tied him to this tree for everybody to see, they bragged about it. They were captured. They were tried by the authorities. One of them was afraid of, of getting the death penalty, so he turned to state's evidence and told everything that happened. The other one was found guilty and received the death penalty. He was actually executed. Uh, Henry Hayes was his name. He was executed in 1996. He's Alabama's first execution for white on black crime since 1913. He was also the only KKK member in the nation to be executed for the murder of a black person during the entire 20th century. Now, what happened to the man who made that statement that precipitated this? They were going to try him, but he died before they could try him. So that's what happened to those individuals. That was in 1980, ladies and gentlemen. So let's go back in time a little bit. I mentioned earlier 1919 was a very important time in U.S. history. It was known as Red Summer because you had race riots erupted in nearly 30 cities nationwide. All around the country, you had race riots. And I'm not going to tell you much about those riots because I want you guys to see uh, a film clip uh, that's going to talk about it. Now this is probably one of the most famous of uh, these race riots that took place. Uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, June 1st, 1921. And you see, this is a postcard. And you see here, someone wrote, running the Negro out of Tulsa. Running the Negro out of Tulsa. And you guys will see a short film clip, and you'll see why they wanted to run these Negroes out of Tulsa. Was this a bombing that was carried out by the U.S. military? Uh, I don't know if the U.S. military was involved. Hold on a second. I must. Uh, I should have checked the sound first. Uh, hold on just a second. All right. I don't think I plugged this in. Probably helps when you plug cords in, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I was an electrician for years, and uh, you'd never know that right now. But uh, 
one of the things that I used to always joke with people, they would come to me and say that, you know, this machine or that machine or something isn't working. And I would always uh, make this joke. It was funny to me, but it wasn't funny. You know, I would say, well, maybe you should try using the O-N, O-F-F switch. That may be an effective method. So. In century, a black middle-class community called Greenwood thrived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, despite segregation and Jim Crow laws. As we go in search of history, we'll uncover a little-known event that was one of the worst racial riots in American history, the night Tulsa burned. The Greenwood section of Tulsa, Oklahoma is the center of African-American life for the more than 11,000 black residents of the city. Within this community lie 108 black-owned businesses, two theaters, two black schools, and 15 doctor's offices. In fact, Greenwood is nationally recognized. First places in Tulsa were poor in the early 1900s. Um, the KKK had a, an enormous presence in Oklahoma um, and in Tulsa particularly. This era would see the racist roots of segregation boil over into numerous armed conflicts throughout the United States. The Tulsa race riot of 1921 it really is set against the backdrop of a multitude of race riots in America. Uh, 1919 was known as Red Summer because literally blood was flowing in the streets. There were over 25 major race riots in 1919 uh, in America. These riots occur in Minnesota, Nebraska, Pennsylvania, and elsewhere throughout the country. The worst riot during the summer of 1919 is in Chicago, which leaves 38 people dead and 1,000 black families homeless. The important thing to remember about race riots during this period is that they are characterized by whites invading black communities. These are not black communities that are erupting. These are white, uh, white citizens, sometimes aided by the police, who are en masse invading black communities, attacking black businesses, and attacking black homes. The person who serves as the spark for Tulsa's riot is Dick Rowland, a 19-year-old black man. He worked downtown. And during that era, the era of the right 1921, there was really only one restroom that was readily accessible to African Americans. And it was on an upper floor of a downtown building called the Drexel Building. The elevator operator at the Drexel Building is a young white woman named Sarah Page. On the morning of May 30th, 1921, as he often did, Dick Rowland went into the Drexel building, got onto the elevator to go and use the restroom. But something happened on the elevator. I'm not exactly sure what did, but what, prob what probably happened is that as he stepped onto the elevator, he tripped and fell into Sarah Page. That shortly after entering the elevator, Dick Rowland was seen running out, leaving behind a screaming Sarah Page. Tuesday, May 31st, 1921. One day after Dick Rowland allegedly assaults Sarah Page on an elevator in downtown Tulsa, the police arrest Rowland and take him to the jail on the top floor of the courthouse. The incident becomes the talk of Tulsa. And a large player in all this was the Tulsa Tribune, one of the major papers in town. The Tulsa Tribune ran a story titled, Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in Elevator. This inflammatory article strongly implies that Dick Rowland, a black man, had raped the young white elevator operator, Sarah Page. 3.15 p.m., the newspaper hits the streets of Tulsa. Over the next 17 hours, the city will be consumed by a race riot on a scale never before seen in America. Once the sun was up, and the mass invasion of Greenwood happened. Whites would typically come in, they would be fighting gun battles with blacks who were defending their homes and businesses before being overwhelmed. When the riot starts, many police officers abandon their duties. They side with the white rioters, deputizing many of them and detaining as many blacks as possible. 
black men were rounded up and taken to detention centers on the notion that that would be for their protection. But what that did was essentially to leave the black community defenseless. The early morning hours of June 1st, 1921. With most members of the community in detention centers, their homes and businesses are looted and burned. I will always remember four men coming in our house with torches and my mother saw them coming and she put the four we children under the bed and from under the bed we could see them walking to the curtains and setting fire to the curtains to set our house on fire. Once authorities in Tulsa realized that the city was really out of hand, a decision was made to go ahead and request the National Guard. So a telegram was sent to Governor Robertson who authorized the Adjutant General to send the National Guard into the city. 9.15 a.m. 17 hours after the mob began to gather outside the courthouse, Oklahoma City units of the National Guard arrive in Tulsa. Martial law is declared at 11.29. The National Guard takes control of the city and puts an end to the violence, burning, and looting. The troops also round up the remaining African Americans and take them to internment centers. The white rioters are disarmed, but for the most part are simply sent home. Greenwood lay in ruin. Confusion lingers in the wake of the riot. Estimates on the death toll are uncertain, and uncounted numbers of blacks leave Tulsa, never to return. The evidence is strong that airplanes were used in, in, in the riot. Um, some say that, that bombs were, were dropped. Others say that nitroglycerin was, was dropped to propel the, the fires that were, that were going. What is certain in the aftermath of the riot is that Greenwood has been permanently altered. At that point, you had a city that was changed forever. Nearly 50 square blocks had been burned to the ground. Nearly a tenth of the population was held under armed guard at, uh, at internment centers. In less than 24 hours, a marauding white mob has transformed a black promised land into a smoldering wasteland. An estimated 300 dead, more than 6,000 blacks in internment centers, over 1,000 black homes and businesses decimated. So as you guys can see, uh, part of the mythology of race riots, when we hear about race riots, we automatically think of the events that happened in Los Angeles after the Rodney King beating. Uh, we think of the civil unrest that occurred in the late 1960s in Watts and Newark, Detroit, places of that, that nature. We're never told this history of Red Summer, these 25 major race riots. They talked a little bit about the one in Chicago. That one was precipitated by a group of young black boys who were swimming at Lake Michigan. And at that particular part of Lake Michigan, that beach, there was just an imaginary line that separated the white side from the black side. And so they were swimming out in the water, this one young man, and he accidentally drifted over into the white section of the lake. And so some white people who were on the beach began throwing rocks at this young man. One of them hit him in the head. He eventually drowned. So the blacks, they were very upset. They called the police. The police came and they arrested several blacks. Didn't arrest any of the white people that actually made this kid lose his life. And this major race riot started in Chicago and it lasted for five days was very, very destructive to Chicago. And that's stories like that that you don't really hear. What year was that again? That was in uh, 1919. So there was also a major race riot in Detroit in 1943 during World War II. Uh, whites were very upset uh, that during, the, during the, the time the war was going on, uh, that a lot of those jobs working, building materials for the war effort, that those jobs had gone to blacks, particularly blacks who had, who had migrated from the south because they could find really good jobs in Detroit working for the war industry. And there was a major race riot that took place uh, where they randomly just beat and killed any black person that they found. And that riot was very, very destructive as well. Uh, we're going to look at some pictures of some violence uh, against blacks during the civil rights era. Some of these pictures you may have seen before. Some of them may be unfamiliar. 
uh, we, we all know that uh, a couple flashpoints in the civil rights movement in terms of violence against blacks, one was in Birmingham, Alabama during the campaign that Dr. King led there. We, we, we all know, because it was, it was just the anniversary of it, the Selma uh, demonstration across the Edmund Pettus Bridge and the violence that went along with that. There was also violence in 1961 with the Freedom Riders attempting to test the segregation laws on interstate travel. So we're going to see some photographs of each of those uh, periods of time. So we're all familiar with the fact that they use water hoses. Now I got the name Birmingham up there for a reason. That's what Birmingham was called by the black people there. There were so many bombs, so many bombs that exploded in black homes, churches, and businesses in Birmingham that they started referring to the city as Birmingham. Uh, one of the leaders of, of uh, the, the civil rights groups uh, in Birmingham had his, his home bombed by dynamite and fortunately for him he was away from the house and ended up not being injured but it was very common for the Ku Klux Klan in particular to bomb black homes businesses and churches and we know the story of the three uh, or the four young girls who were killed in, in the 16th Street Baptist Church there uh, I went down to Birmingham uh, a few years ago um, actually it was in 2008 I went down to Birmingham to the Civil Rights Institute, the big museum they have. Now I had seen all of these images of Birmingham with uh, the fire hoses uh, and all of those different things and I had seen the stories about the 60th Street Baptist Church I, and I heard about the people in the Kelly Ingram Park who had the dog sick on them. I never knew that all of those were like right in the same area. Kelly Ingram Park is this big park that's right in the center of Birmingham and, and these pictures of the water hoses and stuff took place in the streets right around that park and 16th Street Baptist Church is right adjacent to that park. I never knew that until I went there and I, unfortunately for me that on that particular day there was a big wedding at the church so I wasn't able to go inside and see the memorial to those four young girls who were killed uh, but one of the, the interesting things uh, about that is that when Dr. King went to Birmingham to, to lead this campaign one of the methods that he had he had implemented with his group, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, was to fill up the jails. And the only way they could really do that was to utilize young people. And so he, he actually convinced all of these young people who really didn't feel they had anything to, to lose by going to jail. Uh, and, and many of the black people in Birmingham were, were just furious at Dr. King. Actually, when he came in town, they told him to leave as soon as he got there. They said, you're a rabble rouser, you're a troublemaker, we don't want you here. We already got everything handled, we're dealing with the authorities, we're going to get everything fixed ourselves. We don't need you coming in here. And so he was not a very popular person in Birmingham. And especially when things like this began to happen, then they really began to criticize him tremendously. Uh, before you leave that picture. Yes, sir. Um, Kelly Ingram Park, which is across the street. Mm -hmm. um, if you stand there at the entrance to the park, you realize that all the trees on the street side are fairly young. Mm -hmm. And all the trees in the back of the park are much older. Because all the trees in the front of the park had the bark stripped off by the fire hoses. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I didn't notice that when yeah. I was there. Our, our tour bus driver was one of those kids. Oh, wow. wow. That's... Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Uh, and you know, like I said, it was young people, so the, the adults in town were very upset with Dr. King for uh, putting these young people in harm's way as he did. When you say adults, you're saying African-American Yeah, the black adults were furious at Dr. King. They didn't want him to come, they wanted him to leave, uh, but he did, you know, he did stay, uh, but they were very furious with him. So this is Bloody Selma, uh, Bloody Sunday in Selma. You see John here, Lewis John there. Lewis is here. This is a famous His picture of John Lewis. His own parents did not want him involved in any Absolutely. of this. They were afraid of losing their jobs, the mm -hmm. lives of their kids. Oh, yeah. Great yeah. fear. So it was very risky uh, to participate in this. Uh, many young blacks who were in college were actually forced out of their colleges. They kicked them out of school. And so they were risking their entire futures to be a part of this. And, and of course, John Lewis, uh, this was not the only beating that he took. This was his second serious beating uh, because you'll see another picture uh, later with him in it as well. Um, these are some of the people who were injured on that bloody uh, Sunday in Selma. Um, 
This is a picture of one of the Freedom Riders buses. I believe this is right outside of Anniston, Alabama, where the members of the Klan and the police came and tried to set the bus on fire with all of the Freedom Riders on the bus. Fortunately for them, there was a white person who actually opened the door and helped them to get out of the bus. Otherwise, they would have all burned up inside of that bus. Uh, there's a great book that was written, written about this. It's probably about 700 pages, but it's really, I mean, it's, I'm not going to lie and say it's easy to read because it's not. Mm -hmm. But it's fascinating to hear the stories of all the people that were involved. Uh, best book ever written about the Freedom Riders. And PBS did a wonderful documentary about them as well, yes. if you guys ever have the opportunity to see that. Yes. Uh, here, here's John Lewis again, and another one of the young men who was on the bus who was beaten unmercifully by this mob of whites. Uh, and so you can see that violence against blacks continued unabated. Uh, in fact, uh, when they stopped um, and this beating took place, the authorities actually allowed the Klan 20 minutes undisturbed to beat the living day out of these people. 20 minutes. And so they came after the 20 minutes was over. By then, uh, many of these people had to be hospitalized. Uh, this is one of the uh, cases of civil unrest. I believe this was in Newark, New Jersey. Some of the same pictures from uh, that particular time. Uh, there was a riot at Ole Miss. Uh, and Ole Miss is in Oxford, Mississippi. It's the, you know, the, the, the big school in, in Mississippi. Uh, it's about 30 miles from my hometown. I have a couple cousins that have attended Ole Miss. But they had riots there after uh, James Meredith uh, was allowed to become a student. Yes, sir. Uh, back a couple of photos to the gray bus. Yes. That photo went around the world. Uh, the communist nations, their papers published it and said, you know, in essence, look at America. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I've, I've actually seen uh, some of those newspapers uh, in the Russian language with the picture of the bus. And so it, it was used during the Cold War. All of these things that were happening. In fact, uh, even during World War II, the Germans and the Japanese used lynching pictures to basically castigate the United States saying, you guys are claiming that you're for freedom and democracy and all this, and look how you treat black people in your country. And so these, these images, like you said, spread around the world and really caused a great deal of embarrassment for the United States uh, in many, many places. Um, this is, is something uh, that's very valuable to me. Uh, Medgar Evers was the leader of the NAACP in, uh, in Mississippi, and he was shot in the back uh, by Byron Dale Beckwith, who ended up not being tried and found guilty until about 30 years later for his uh, assassination. He was getting out of his car on his way into his home. He was standing in his driveway and he was shot in the back. So that's an article about him. But this is James Meredith, the, the man who had uh, supposedly desegregated Ole Miss. I don't know how one person does it, but I guess one person can desegregate something. And so he did this march for freedom. And along this march on the highway in Mississippi, somebody shot him and injured him uh, severely. And this is a picture uh, shortly after Dr. King was, was shot uh, and killed in uh, Memphis at the Lorraine Motel. If you guys ever have the opportunity to go to Memphis, uh, you should go to the National Civil Rights Museum at the Lorraine Motel. Uh, I've been there three different times, and, and the last time I was there, the building across the street where the, the shots were fired from, they've actually purchased that property and turned that into part of the museum. And they have a tremendous, tremendous amount of information about the assassination, the investigations, uh, about whether or not it was, it was a lone gunman or it was a conspiracy. I mean, they have all of that stuff. Uh, it's just tremendous to be able to see that. And they don't, they don't draw any conclusions for you. They say, you look at the evidence yourself and you decide what you believe happened. And so it's right. really a tremendous experience. I stood right on that balcony, mm -hmm. right there where the, the man yeah. was pointing. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andrew Young is one of the people there. Uh, Jesse Jackson is one of these individuals, too. Uh, in fact, Jesse Jackson embarrassed himself. Uh, what he did was he was there uh, trying to assist Dr. King after he was shot, and blood was everywhere. And, and he got blood all over his shirt. And so I think the following day, there was a news conference or something he still had on that bloody shirt. And people were like, really, dude? You couldn't change shirts? 
you're just trying to you know make yourself seem special so that was something that was very interesting uh about that event but it, it's 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 a really uh eye-opening experience to go to that museum and be able to stand on that spot like jerry and says mm -hmm. to be able to see the room that dr king was was in on that particular day it's, it's fascinating visit if you ever have the opportunity at the time i was there um the, the room and that balcony was closed to the public the only reason i got to be there was with a group of work officials and uh -huh. a judge in memphis um took us in <laughs> he was on the board of the lucky you <laughs> very very yeah <laughs> all right and quite, so quite an experience great great so now we're going to transition uh into the next segment which is police slash vigilante violence against blacks and so a lot of these events are things that have happened uh in the the, the recent past some of them a little bit older uh and it, i remember i told you guys earlier about the graphicness the graphic nature of some of the the photos and videos you guys are going to see some videos that are very disturbing during the course of this Police officers facing felony criminal charges were among a group of 15 who stopped a 25-year-old black man last Saturday night, then beat him, kicked him, and clubbed him, unaware that an amateur photographer was recording the incident on videotape. Los Angeles Police Chief Darrell Gates looked at the tape and said he thinks assault with a deadly weapon will be one of the charges. In our review, we find that uh, the officers uh, struck him with batons uh, between 53 and 56 times. Uh, one officer rendered uh, uh, six kicks and one officer one kick. Civil rights organizations say the Los Angeles Police Department has a history of brutality and misconduct that goes back a quarter of a century, including one incident that sparked the Watts riots. So far this year, there have been more than 125 complaints of police misconduct filed with watchdog organizations. We no longer want to have to wake up each morning not knowing what fear to expect next. Today, we are not sure that the police is there to protect us. But Chief Gates today called the LAPD a model department and said he has no plans to resign. Gary Shepard, ABC News, Los Angeles. I was actually living in Los Angeles area at that time, uh, and I can very clearly remember uh, the first time I saw the, the, the video on the news, and I can remember when they, they, they decided to, to, to move the venue for the trial to Simi Valley, away from Los Angeles, and, and Simi Valley just by coincidence, I guess, happened to be a place where police and firefighters retire to. <laughs> and so, of course, you want to get a biased jury and you, you move it there. I can tell you how it happened. I was, I was working for the newspaper in Pasadena when the beating took place, so mm -hmm. it's sort of a front row seat for that. I was working for the court when the trial mm -hmm. took place. And um, they wanted the, uh, the defense wanted a change of venue uh, because they said it was too inflammatory in Los Angeles County. Mm -hmm. The judge in the case was given three places to move it to. One was uh, uh, Orange County, which is also very... <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the other was uh, Oakland, uh, or Alameda County up north, and then this uh, Ventura County was the third county. And he, this judge, lived in West Los Angeles. and. That was the most convenient for him. Ventura County was the most convenient for him in his commute. Uh, and it just so happened that the courthouse in Ventura was overcrowded, but they had available space in the brand new courthouse that had just opened in Simi Valley. That's how the trial ended up in Simi Valley. And yes, every I think every uh, every cop not retired active duty they didn't they weren't required to live in Los Angeles mm -hmm. uh, police uh, of, or law enforcement officers and fire um, uh, fire p uh, fighters lived in the Simi Valley area so that um, kind of comprised the jury the wow. people who were related to these people great thanks for sharing that and one of the interesting things once once the the verdict came back and then the civil unrest began. I was, you know, I was at work, and I can remember I was an electrician at the time, and, you know, everybody gathered in the lunchroom around the television to hear the verdict, and we heard the verdict, and, and we immediately knew it was, it was not gonna be good. And so the, 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 the people that were in charge of the company told everybody, you know what, just go home now. You know, it was maybe 11, 11.30, I don't remember. But it was fairly early, and they said, get in your cars, go home now, because it's gonna be some mess. And I can remember I went home and, and I just stayed in my apartment 
flipping through the different channels, watching all these things on the news. And one of the things that, that, that I tell people, the power that the media has to control the behavior of people. You know, we, we, we hear all these stories about the looting that occurred and you know the police standing there not preventing people from looting. And I can remember, I don't remember the name of the store, it was a big box store, like a Target or something, uh, in, in um, Inglewood, I believe. And, and so you saw this image from the news helicopters and it was like seven, eight different news channels in LA and all of them had a helicopter. They, they were hovering over the store and you saw a handful of people running in and out of the store, grabbing stuff and running out and jumping into their cars. And I mean, it was maybe 10 people max. I'm telling you within five minutes of that helicopter shot, you saw cars pulling up from every direction. People jumping out and just loading up their cars with all kinds of stuff. And I can remember some of the stuff that I saw people stealing. I saw people, this one old guy was running down the street pushing a cart full of Budweiser. I mean, it's like he got every Budweiser that they had in that store. There was another guy that I saw running down the street pushing a grand piano down the street. I'm like thinking, dude, you're not gonna be able to get that in your house. It's probably not gonna fit through the door. I saw another store that was being looted and the guys actually brought a pickup truck and they tied a chain to the to the gate in front of the store and they were trying their best to pull this gate off and they ended up yanking the bumper off the back of their truck. It was just absolutely crazy. And I tell people that at the time when I was living in LA, you know, they say bad things come in threes. So not too long before this, there was an earthquake that knocked me out of my bed. The biggest earthquake I ever felt when I lived out there. Then there was another earthquake when I was at work. So that's two things, but I combine them into one. Two earthquakes. And if you've never experienced an earthquake, you don't want to experience an earthquake, believe me. Then this happened, and then shortly thereafter, I was being a good Samaritan, helping these two young women whose car wouldn't, wouldn't run, and I, me and another guy helped them get the car running. And one of the young ladies worked for an airline. So I was planning on flying back to Milwaukee, you know. And so she said, well, I, I can get you some, some, some cheap tickets. I'll hook you up, right? So she said, just give me your number. And I'm thinking, okay, wow, this is great. You know, I'm going to get a cheap ticket home. And, and, and the next thing I know, a couple days later, this, this, this woman calls me. And she says, I'm just calling to thank you for, you know, you being so nice and helping us with the car. And, you know, I just, I was telling my whole family about how nice you are. And I got on the elevator at work and it was a lady at work. And I was just telling her, I just fell in love with you right away. And I'm like thinking, this woman is crazy. <laughs> and so I'm like, well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm kind of busy. I'm on my way to school. I was going to school at the time. So I hung up. She called me back the next day. Oh, I just gotta let you meet my mother. My mother's so excited about meeting I'm thinking, she is really crazy. And I mean, this went on for like two or three days. And finally I just said, you know what? I, I can't take it anymore. I'm just gonna have to tell her, leave me alone. And she called me and I said, don't call me anymore. And I hung up on her. I should have never done that. This crazy woman, the next day, I got off work. I was in my apartment taking a shower. My next door neighbor knocked on my door and I'm, you know, just getting out of the shower. And he's like, dude, somebody's messing with your car. I'm like, what? So I go outside and this crazy woman has slashed all four of my tires. Oh. I'm like thinking, oh my goodness. So of course I had to spend like $400 or whatever it was to get all new tires on my car. The next day, get off work, take a shower, knock on the door again. Dude, somebody just smashed your windshield on your car. And it was like a brick laying on the hood of my car. My windshield was smashed. I'm like thinking, oh my God. So I call the police. I didn't even remember her name. I remember her first name, but I didn't remember what she said her last name was. And I knew that her friend lived in like the apartment right down the street. I didn't even know her name. So I told the police, I lied to the police. And I can freely admit I lied. I saw her do it. I didn't see her, but I said I did. And so they came to the girl's apartment and they, 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 they knocked on her apartment. And this is off topic, but it's such a crazy story I love to share. <laughs> so we went to this apartment, right? And the police knocked on the door and this girl's friend opened the door and they said, you know, it's such and such and so and so here. She said, no, I haven't seen her. And then I told her what happened. And she says, what? She did that to your car? And she said, yeah, she is here. And so these are two big, I mean, like six, three, six, four, big husky police officers, right? And so they call her out of the back, she's in the back bedroom, and this crazy woman comes running out, and this woman was like maybe five, three, like 87 pounds soaking wet, right? Little bitty woman. She comes, ah, running up, and she tried to attack me in front of these police officers. They grabbed her and body slammed her. I feel bad that they body slammed her, but I was glad she didn't get to me. And on that day, I said, 
it's time to go back to New York. <laughs> and within two days, I dropped out of school, sold some stuff, left some stuff, packed up my TV, some clothes, and drove back to Milwaukee. Just like the sharing it with you. <laughs> that was the third strike. <laughs> All right, so to get back to the bad stuff, that was bad too. Uh, how many of you guys have heard of Abner Louima? Yes. Uh, a Haitian immigrant who lived in New York City was forcibly sodomized and, and beaten uh, by New York City police officers who actually stuck a broom handle uh, in his behind uh, and they they used their fists, nightsticks, police radios to beat him on the way to the police station. Absolutely brutalized this young man. Uh, and two of them were pulled off the beat uh, right away as a result of this story. So one of the officers kicked him in the private parts. Then when his hands were cut behind his back, he grabbed and squeezed his, his private parts and sodomized this young man with a broomstick. So imagine this, how brutal this is. And so even uh, he admitted uh, that he ran through the police station with bloody excrement stained uh, nightstick uh, in his hand bragging to other police and the sergeant there that he took a man down tonight. They also uh, knocked some of his teeth out of his mouth during the course of this beating as well. Um, December 13th, 1999, that officer was sentenced to 30 years in prison without the possibility of parole. One of the other uh, officers was convicted June 27th for helping him uh, assault Louima, and he was sentenced to 15 years in prison, but that was overturned on appeal. Uh, and then he was tried for perjury uh, in 2002 and given a sentence of five years. He was released in February 2007. Uh, his, his, uh, Mr. Louima and his family filed a lawsuit against the city of New York and settled for $8.75 million in 2001. And that was the largest police brutality settlement in New York City history. And after legal fees, they ended up with $5.8 million. But $5.8 million sounds like a lot of money, but that does not bring back your dignity that was taken from you. That does not uh, bring back the value to your life that these men took away from you, devaluing you in such a way that they would uh, do these horrible things to you. So that was in 1997 in New York. Amadou Diallo was another famous case from New York. 22-year-old uh, immigrant from Guinea was shot and killed by four undercover uh, plains close police officers who fired, fired a total of 41 shots, 19 of which killed him. Um, he supposedly fit the description of a, a serial rapist who they eventually caught years later uh, and tried and convicted, sent him to prison forever. Uh, but Mr. Diallo was walking up into the stoop where he lived and these, these guys who, who we don't know whether or not they identified themselves as police. They claimed they did. Uh, he just kind of ignored them and then they yelled at him and he turned around and he reached for his wallet to show them identification. And one of the officers said, gun. They started to fire. One of the officers, as he was firing, he actually fell down the steps into the stoop and the other officers thought, oh, he's been shot. And they fired even more and they eventually killed him uh, by shooting at very close range uh, to Mr. Diallo. Um, in March 1999, uh, they were indicted on charges of second degree murder and reckless endangerment. Uh, and there was a change of venue order to move the trial to Albany, New York. Uh, after two days of deliberation, uh, the officers were acquitted of all charges. Uh, later in 2000, his uh, mother and stepfather filed a $61 million lawsuit, uh, $20 million plus $1 million for each shot that was fired, uh, and they ended up selling that suit uh, for just $3 million. So that's another case of the devaluation of black lives by authority figures. Uh, Sean Bell is another famous case from New York as well. Uh, Bell was 24. Uh, he was attending his bachelor party uh, with some of his friends. Uh, the police accosted them in the parking lot and they fired 50 shots into the vehicle and they killed uh, him on the day that he was supposed to get married. One of the officers emptied two full magazines, fired 31 times, pausing to reload at least one time. Uh, in March of 2007, three to five police officers were indicted by a grand jury. Uh, 2008, all three officers were indicted, were acquitted on all counts. 2010, uh, his family 
uh, received a settlement of $3.25 million. Uh, eventually, the three officers and the commanding officer were fired or forced to resign in 2012. So once again, you don't really have justice in the case of a black person whose life has been taken by authority figures. Oscar Grant, um, if you guys have ever seen the movie Fruitvale Station, uh, I, I saw it at the theater when it first came out. It's been on kind of regular um, rotation uh, on cable television. And after seeing it that first time, I can't watch it again. I cannot watch that movie again. It's just too sad uh, to see what happened in this young man. He was shot and killed by the BART police. BART means Bay Area Rapid Transit. That's the, you know, the, the, the subway system uh, in uh, Oakland slash San Francisco area. And so, um, he was being restrained after there was a fight on the train. He was being restrained. He was lying on his uh, face down with an officer uh, right above him with his knee and his back. That officer fired a shot. He claimed that he thought he was reaching for his taser. Oh. And, well, listen, this is the way I look at it. So, you're a police officer. You're a right-handed police officer. Your gun is here, right? And it's black. Your taser is here, and it's bright, fluorescent yellow. So I don't know how you can do this and end up over here by mistake and then fire. Because the last time I checked, if you're going to tase somebody, you don't want to be in contact with that person, right? Because you're going to be tasing yourself. But that's the excuse that the officer used. Uh, and he was charged with the murder. Uh, he resigned and he pled not guilty. Uh, a jury returned his verdict. He was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter, not guilty of second degree murder or voluntary manslaughter, and he was sentenced to two years, two years with double credit for time already served, reducing his term by 292 days. For the 146 days he'd already spent in jail, he served his time in the Los Angeles County Jail, occupying a private cell away from other prisoners. He was released. May 3rd, 2011, and they settled uh, with his daughter and his mother for $2.8 million, the Bay Area Rapid Transit uh, did. Trayvon Martin, I'm sure you guys are familiar with his story. 17-year-old uh, kid was fatally shot by a vigilante, George Zimmerman, in Stanford, Florida. Uh, Zimmerman was charged uh, and acquitted of the murder of his 17-year-old kid. Uh, and, and really the interesting thing outside of, of, of the fact that most people have heard of the Trayvon Martin thing. When he was shot and killed in February, it wasn't a news story nationwide. It wasn't until March, about a month later, when black people on Twitter were sharing this story with one another. And it became this huge, you know, just went viral on, on, on Twitter. And then other people started hearing about it. Then the national media heard about it. And it became this, this really important story. And everybody heard about uh, what happened uh, to Trayvon Martin. Now, this is a, a case that you guys may or may not have heard of. This is a case that should have been national news. Should have been on the news in Milwaukee on a regular basis. It made the national news, but just a little blip about it. And it's a story of these four police officers who were charged with randomly strip searching black men, some in public, some in the police station. And they were doing cavity searches of these young men. Now, I'm not going to give you too much of the grisly details because uh, it's just very ugly to even hear what they did to the people. But they were charged with felonies related to illegal rectal searches of suspects on the street and in police district stations from 2010 through 2012. In one case, an officer held a gun to a man's head as two others held his arms and a third put him in a chokehold while jamming a hand into his anus, purportedly searching for evidence of drugs, according to the criminal complaint. Another man bled from his rectum for several days after his encounter with police. And, and, and these are kind of the tamest ones. There were some that were much, much worse than this, including, I believe, a 15-year-old kid that they did this to as well. Uh, so these police officers did this, uh, and it, it really didn't end the way it was supposed to. Two of the officers uh, who admitted they were present during the body cavity searches, uh, and a third officer were neither criminally charged nor fired from the department after making deals with prosecutors. Uh, one of the officers, Michael Gasser, avoided termination. And 
he didn't get charged, he didn't get fired, and now this guy works as a training officer, training rookie patrol officers in Milwaukee. Imagine that. You do illegal cavity searches, and this was, this was their excuse. We didn't know that was illegal. We thought we could search their bodies for drugs. So you mean to tell me you thought that you could make a person stand in the middle of the street on a residential street in front of the public, force them to take their pants and their underwear off and force your hand into their private parts? You thought that was okay. That was their justification. And the chief of police in Milwaukee said, well, you know what? The issue is that it's a training issue. We need to train officers. They didn't know any better. So now they're training work. I wanted to jump through the television screen and slap the chief myself after I heard that mess on the TV. I'm like, are you kidding me? It's a training issue? Give me a break. Let's do a cavity search on the police chief and see what he says. Well, he wouldn't be happy with it. Zachary Thomas, another officer, admitted in a deposition that he and Officer Michael Bagnini coerced a suspect to try to defecate into a cardboard box at the District 5 police station, hoping he would expel hidden drugs. U.S. Department of Justice, this is their definition of rape. So let's read this carefully together. The penetration, no matter how slight, of the vagina or anus with any body part or object or oral penetration by a sex organ or of another person without the consent of the victim. Doesn't that sound like what the police officers did to these gentlemen? By that definition, it's rape, right? <laughs> Give me a break. They're not going to charge a man with rape. The aftermath. Two supervisors who were in charge of District 5 got promotions. Good job, guys. Your officers are doing a knockout job out there on the streets, violating folks. 50 people have sued, and I believe that number is much higher now. Uh, the police department contending that they were the victims of improper strip and cavity searches from 2008 to 2012. The same thing happened in Chicago. A group of officers there were doing the exact same thing, and the city has settled uh, up at the time this article was written in 2014. They had paid more than $100 million in lawsuits in Chicago as a result of these activities. Former officer uh, Bagnini was sentenced to 26 months in prison after he pleaded no contest to four felonies and four misdemeanors for conducting these illegal strip, strip and rectal searches. I think that's the only thing that's really going to give people pause is the fact that it's costing so much money. Yeah, right. and, but I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you why I don't think that's going to happen. Because you don't know. You don't hear about it, really. No. You, 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 I mean... In some cases, you hear about it, like I'm sure all of you heard the news about Eric Garner's family right. receiving a settlement of $5.9 million. But in a lot of these cases, you know, maybe the big ones, the big settlements you hear about, but if there's a $50,000 settlement, $25,000 settlement, $75,000, yeah. $125,000, that's not going to be newsworthy. That won't be on the news. Yes? But this, uh, this type of thing... Is is supposed to be with people are supposed to know about it? Yeah. They keep it hush hush because it continues to go on and nobody is really doing anything about it because the Hispanic community, the the, the male Mexican or undocumented community mm -hmm. isn't isn't even in the numbers there mm -hmm. of what's being done to them and they're trying to unite with the black but because they continue to argue with each other we can't get. Um, united enough to say something about the evil things that are happening that powerful white people are letting it happen. Yeah, absolutely. Because this is a shame. It's it's appalling. Absolutely. And people don't I remember I remember when we tried to to help the people that were being victimized. And uh, we were they we can it's difficult, especially when you get attorneys involved in it and they, and they don't want to and we have governors and DAs that can do all kinds of things too. Yeah. So one of the other officers <laughs> received a sentence of 20 days in jail, 60 hours community service, and a $300 fine. Uh, this is a story that you may have heard about recently uh, mm -hmm. because the one of the officers charged was, it, well, I'll let, I'll let the video after this speak for itself, but these people were killed in Cleveland, uh, shot by um, police officers, 13 police officers total shot rounds into this car. 
62 squads chased them. They were originally pulled over by one squad and they, they fled for some unknown reason. And as they were fleeing in this very old car, they passed by the police headquarters and their car, which was a 1970-something car, backfired. The police thought that they were firing and eventually 62 police cars chased them. Uh, and they, they eventually pulled them over. Uh, and of the six officers charged, none were found guilty. Uh, Mr. Russell suffered 25 gunshots, and Ms. Williams, 23. And I want you guys to watch this video. It was 10.30 at night, November 29th, 2012. An officer with the Cleveland Police Department pulled over this couple. Uh, Timothy Russell was at the wheel, Melissa Williams is in the passenger seat, the couple pulled over. But then, for whatever reason, before the officer could approach their car for that traffic stop, they took off, they sped away. And they happened to speed past Cleveland Police Headquarters, and just as they did that, their car backfired. It happens. It was an older car. It was a 1979 Chevy Malibu. It apparently backfired, and officers mistook that car backfiring for a gunshot. And what happened next, basically, is that all hell broke loose. A high-speed chase ensued. 62 police cars chased those two suspects in that one car through the street. 62 police cars. More than 100 Cleveland police officers involved in that one police chase. The medical examiner did rule both of the deaths in the car chase as a homicide. Five officers were eventually brought up on misdemeanor charges. Only one officer was brought up on a more serious charge of voluntary manslaughter. And he was just one of the 13 officers who fired bullets into that car after that car chase. Nobody was shooting at those officers. Nobody was shooting except the other officers. There were so many police officers there, so jacked up, and so many of them were shooting. Police did turn it into a huge firefight in an incredible shooting gallery, but they were the only ones. Timothy Russell and Melissa Williams were unarmed. They were not wearing bulletproof vests. They fired zero shots because they had zero weapons. All 137 shots fired that night were fired by Cleveland police officers. More than a dozen officers fired their weapons that night. Timothy Russell and Melissa Williams, again unarmed, were each shot more than 20 times. One of the officers who fired shots that night did so from the top of a squad car. Officer Michael Brillo got up on top of a squad car, stood on top of the car, and then shot 15 rounds down at the suspects through their windshield. He was up on a police car firing down at them. He'd already emptied a previous clip. He'd reloaded in order to do that. Officer Brillo was the only officer charged with a crime following that completely, completely bizarre incident. The officer was charged with voluntary manslaughter. And this past weekend, Officer Brillo, the one who climbed up on top of the car to shoot down into the windshield, uh, he was found not guilty. 137 shots fired into that car. Two unarmed people, both shot more than 20 times. Only one officer charged, and that officer acquitted of everything. In summary, I find that the state did not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, Michael Brillo, knowingly caused the deaths of Timothy Russell and Melissa Williams because the essential element of causation was not proved for both counts. I therefore find the defendant not guilty of counts one and two as indicted. The state did prove a lesser included offense of felonious assault on both counts by demonstrating beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant knowingly caused serious physical harm to both victims. But the defendant proved by a preponderance of the evidence that he is legally excused from liability for those crimes because he caused the serious physical harm of the victims in a constitutionally reasonable effort to end an objectively reasonable perception that he and the others present were threatened by Russell and Williams with imminent serious bodily harm. I therefore also find the defendant not guilty of felonious assault, the lesser included offense on both indicted counts, and the defendant is discharged. Thank you, Rockwell. Oh, there's so much emotional damage there, wasn't it? Supposedly, the, the judge and, and the, the defendant asked for a bench trial, not a jury trial, because I think he was pretty sure he'd be he'd get off with a, with a judge deciding the case. And the judge said, yes, it was ruled a homicide, but there was no demonstra demonstrable proof that the bullet that killed mm -hmm. those people came from that officer's gun. Yeah, he was the one sitting. 
right. So you couldn't prove that the bullets he fired were the actual ones that actually caused yeah. the death. Right. So apparently, the bullets that caused the death just came from whoever. Yeah. Some of the other officers. But they can prove which bullets. Oh no, that's right. I'm sorry. The bullets were too badly damaged to be able to right. tell what which gun it came from. Right. And they couldn't tell which bullets actually finally killed them. So, once again, the evaluation of black lives. Dontre Hamilton, Milwaukee, was shot 14 times for sleeping on a park bench outside of a Starbucks in downtown Milwaukee. Uh, the officer who killed him was fired, not because he fired 14 bullets into Dontre Hamilton's body, but because he didn't follow department procedures for dealing with emotionally disturbed people. Uh, he faced no criminal charges, and he's actually trying to get his job back because he filed a claim before he was removed from the police department. So he may end up, through the appeals process, getting his job back. <laughs> of Sergeant James Brown. He served two tours of duty in Iraq, only to die in a jail in El Paso, Texas in 2012. Authorities claim Brown died due to a pre-existing medical condition, but shocking new video from inside the jail raises new questions about what happened to the 26-year-old African-American man. He said, I can't breathe 11 times here in Garner. Um, the police officer who put him in the chokehold claimed it wasn't a chokehold. They're still denying it was a chokehold. Um, grand jury decided not to indict the officer, and the family just settled on July 13th for $5.9 million. Michael Brown, uh, we're all familiar with that case. I don't know if you guys have seen this video of the interview of the young man who was with him. Uh, me and my young friend was walking down the street in the middle of the street, and we wasn't causing any harm to nobody. Uh, we had no weapons on us at all. We just walking, having a uh, conversation. No cars were blowing at us or honking at us like we was uh, holding up traffic or anything like that. Uh, and, uh, a police officer squad car pulled up. And when he pulled up, these were his exact words. He said, get the on the sidewalk. And we told the officer we was not but a minute away from our destination. And we was shortly be out the street. We was having a conversation. And uh, he went about his way for about one or two seconds as we continued to walk. And then he reversed his uh, truck, his car, and in a manner to where it almost hit us. And it blocked both lanes off the way he uh, turned his car. So he pulled up on the side of us. He tried to brush his door open, but we were so close to it that it ricocheted off us and it bounced back to him. And I guess that, you know, uh, got him a little upset. And at that time, he reached out the window. He didn't get out the car. He just reached his arm out the window and grabbed my friend around his neck and was trying to, as he was trying to choke my friend, and he was trying to get away, and the officer then reached out, and he grabbed his arm to pull him into the car. So now it was like the officer's pulling him inside the car, he's trying to pull away. And at no time the officer said that uh, he was going to do anything until he pulled out his weapon. His weapon was drawn, and he said, I'll shoot you, or I'm going to shoot. And in the same moment, the first shot went off. And we looked at him, he, he was shot, and it was blood coming from him, and we took off running. And as we took off running, I ducked and hid for my life because I was feared for my life. And I hid by the first car that I saw. My friend, he kept running, and he told me to keep running because he feared for me too. So as he was running, the officer uh, was trying to get out of the car, and once he got out the car, he uh, he pursued my friend, but his, uh, his weapon was drawn. Now, he didn't see any weapon drawn at him or anything like that, us going for no weapon. 
his weapon was already drawn when he got out the car. He shot again, and once my friend felt that shot, he turned around and he put his hands in the earth, and he started to get down, but the officer still approached with his weapon drawn, and he fired several more shots, and my friend died. He didn't say anything to him. He just stood over and he was shooting, and he was shooting. By the end, I was so afraid for my life, I just, I got up and I ran. That was shortly after the shooting took place. He gave that interview. Jameer Rice, 12 year old kid, shot and killed by a Cleveland police officer. Less than two seconds after they arrived on the scene, the person they called 911 and said they saw someone with what looked like a gun, but he said it may be a toy gun, but he's scaring the heck out of me. The squads arrived. He was standing uh, on his playground holding the gun, and they pulled up next to him. There's a video of it. I mean, almost as soon as they pulled up next to him, the officer got out and shot him within two seconds. They claim they gave him three warnings to drop the gun. Now, how do you give somebody three warnings and, and, and people that were there witnesses, and they didn't hear the police say anything to him, and it was impossible for them to give this kid three warnings within two seconds? Because if, you, if you're going to shoot the person within two seconds, your gun is already in your hand, ready to be fired within a second. So you're basically saying you gave him three warnings in about a second's time. And so, of course, uh, his family filed a wrongful death claim. Uh, a judge, an Ohio judge, unrelated to the case, said he had found probable cause to charge a police officer with murder for the fatal shooting. Uh, but uh, the municipal court uh, basically said there were grounds to prosecute the officer. But the district attorney said, well, I'm going to let the grand jury decide what to do instead. We've seen the video of Walter Scott being pursued. Uh, the officer planted a taser on him after he had shot him in the back, claimed that he had fought with him, that uh, Mr. Scott took the taser from him. Unknowingly, somebody was videotaping. The guy that was videotaping actually said that he was so afraid for his life that he had videotaped this, that he was going to hit the delete button on his phone and delete the video. Fortunately for us, he didn't, and it completely contradicted the story that the officer, as well as his commanding officer, gave the day of this shooting. They said it was a good shoot, that the man had fought with the officer, blah, 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 and then video came out, and they said, oh, we messed up. And it, as I was telling Nick earlier today, one of the things that I've never seen police officers do, there's a lot of chat rooms around the country that police officers use, and there was one, a guy wrote an article about it, and he says he had gone in his chat room and just kind of looked at the conversations that the police were having, and he said he was shocked that police around the country were actually saying this was a bad shoot, that this guy actually murdered this guy. He said he was shocked that police officers are actually saying that about it. And so um, that is an ongoing investigation. Freddie Gray. We've seen the unrest in Baltimore after he was uh, found uh, unconscious in a police van and died uh, a week later after falling into a coma. Uh, police officers the were fired. Death of a young man in Baltimore police custody. The autopsy on uh, this 25 year old is now complete. Uh, the names of the officers involved in his arrest, uh, arrest released. But more information has not led, though, to any more clarity as far as how this 25-year-old suspect, Freddie Gray, broke his neck after Baltimore police arrested him. This is back on April 12th. He died a week later. Uh, now, as we mentioned a second ago, the department has suspended these six officers with pay. They've released their names, their ages, how long they've been on the force. But officials didn't specify on the reasons why. However, the mayor of Baltimore did tell CNN this. We know that he asked for medical attention. We know that that medical attention was not immediately requested for him. Uh, we know that was a mistake. That conclusion, based on the fact that Gray asked for medical help more than once while being transported in a van. In fact, city and police officials revealed Gray requested his inhaler, his asthma inhaler, at the same time officers called for the van. They also disclosed that Gray was put in leg restraints, but officials say they do not know how or when Gray's spinal cord was severed. And what's more, Gray's autopsy revealed his spinal injury was the only trauma to his body. There. A warning, the video is tough to watch. <laughs> Sure, you got 
that was after they tasted out of them like that. Man, I've been recording. I've been recording. I've been recording. What car they come out of, yo? He on the bike, yo, right there. Him right there. He on the bike. May I have your attention, please? The library will close in 20 minutes. Have any items to check out? Please do so now. Thank you. Yeah, I sure will. I sure will. So, of course, we remember uh, that the officers had charges filed against six of them. Um, and that's an ongoing um, thing in Baltimore. Recently, the um, police commissioner, Anthony Batts, was uh, fired by the mayor um, because basically the police stopped doing their jobs. There was a spike in homicides. The police basically just said, screw it, we're not going to do anything. Uh, citizen complaints against the police not doing their job soared, and so he was fired. Uh, and this is a very important part of the story, which is not made the national news. Um, black women who have been killed by police. And I'm going to show you guys a video of that. Oh, you know what? Now I think about it, I can't show you the video. The video ended up not working, but there's a series of black women that have been killed by police officers. Uh, and their story has been told. There's a group that started a movement called Say Her Name. And it tells you the story of these women that have been killed. I believe I couldn't get that video to work if I remember correctly. Uh, disparity in the use of the death penalty. Of the 455 men executed for rape in the United States between 1930 and 1967, 405 of them were black men. White victims have typically been more valuable since the death penalty was brought back, made legal again uh, in 1976. If you look at all of the victims, the victims refer to the victims in the underlying murder cases where an execution has occurred. So if you look at all the people that have been executed, the people that were executed for killing them, um, black victims have been 15% of the victims. Latino victims have been 6.8% of the victims. White victims have been 75.8% of the victims. And then other groups have been 2.2%. So you can see that three out of every four of the victims that have been justice served for the person who murdered them have been white people. But if we look at this more closely, we see that if we look at blacks that have been executed and who their victims were, black defendant killing a black person, there's been 175 blacks executed for killing other black people. There's been 294 blacks executed for killing white victims. Even though 93% of the people that blacks killed are other blacks, and 84% of whites are killed by whites, almost twice as many blacks have been killed or executed by the state and federal government for killing white people than for killing black people. That's amazing to me. Let's look a little further. Interracial murders, white defendant and black victims. There have only been 31 whites that have been executed since 1976 for killing black people. Yet there's been 294 blacks executed for killing whites. And 737 whites have been executed for killing other white people. And included in that 31 number are people like Timothy McVeigh, um, a serial killer in North Carolina who killed 30 or 40 people of a variety of different racial groups. So let's look at uh, a few things for solutions. People want to talk about solutions. We've talked about the problem in detail. Uh, and so I want to just talk to you guys about a few things that you can use as solution-based activities. Uh, some of these I've been involved with. The Red Racism Group in Milwaukee, uh, they just worked with us in conjunction with a program we call Hidden History, where we had some, some films that we showed and we had facilitated dialogue about those films. That was a very successful endeavor. We showed uh, six different films over a period of two months. Uh, you can also participate in discussion groups to talk about the issues and possible solutions to the problems. Create book clubs to talk about books like The New Jim Crow. I'm actually facilitating uh, discussion on that book uh, in conjunction with Red Racism, Red Racism Milwaukee. Also, you can take classes like the Unlearning Racism class that the Milwaukee YWCA uh, uh, has each year. And you can also talk with people you know about solutions. So there are opportunities to take this information 
and utilize it to work on solutions because ultimately we can't go back in the past and change any of these events that have happened. We can't do anything to bring those lives of those people back, uh, take that misery out of their lives, but we can work to bring awareness to people and have dialogue about what to do moving forward when it comes to these particular issues. So I want to thank all of you for coming out to uh, participate in this activity. I've really enjoyed it. I'll be doing the same uh, set of talks in Milwaukee uh, next month. Uh, and I'm hoping that the reading list that I left is, is, is a great resource for you guys to find some books that have some great information. If you guys have any questions, please hand them forward and we'll spend a couple quick minutes answering any questions if anyone has any. Well, I just want to ask Ken Jorgen. Ken? Ken? Yeah. Do you want to say something about what some of your plan or an idea I, that you I have? I could, yeah. If that's, uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Tomorrow evening at 6.30 at the Cesar Chavez Center there's going to be a meeting of people who are interested in addressing peace, police misbehavior in Racine. We want to form a citizen review board for the police department whereby people who have been uh, mistreated by the police can register complaints and uh, we're going to do something to address it. We don't know what yet but we want to have a discussion so anybody that would like to come to that and take part in it, it's at 6.30 tomorrow evening at the uh, Chavez Center in the West Conference Room down the end of the hallway and uh, I hope you can make it. There's going to be a meeting whether you're there or not, and I hope you can be there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you for sharing. Anyone else have any uh, anything that they are involved in related to any of these issues? There's a group called Coming Together with Theme that's a kind of a co-sponsor of these programs. Um, we show a movie here at the library every month. If you sign the sign-in sheet and leave me your email, I'll be happy to let you know when the next movie is going to be. We're going to have Mr. Jackson back in October as part of the big read. The choice of the book selected is To Kill a Mockingbird. So you're welcome to join us October 8th. Yes, October 8th, uh, 6 to 8 p.m., I believe. Another thing that, just to add up to the, um, the uh, group, um, this Sometimes we need to learn what is causing all this because it's the racism, is, as you've shown, is generation continues. And if we don't stop, if we don't, if we can, if we're, we're taking care of um, putting a band aid on, on something that just continues. And we need to do something better where we can unite. And, uh, and not just talk about it, but really do so. Yeah. I want to thank Mr. Jackson for coming out these last four sessions. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, appreciate uh, you guys taking time out of your summer, <laughs> enjoying this, this decent weather we have for a couple, six to eight weeks per year here. <laughs> and. Uh, I, I, I always enjoy coming down here to Racine. Uh, I want to thank all of you guys that have that have come out, uh, especially those of you who have come out multiple times. Uh, a lot of familiar faces. Uh, she asked me when am I moving to Racine. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, this is kind of my home away from home. 